Friends, I want to welcome you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to this time of worship on Sunday, October 11th. Today we gather once more to open our hearts to God's love, to be present to one another, to be open to the mystery of life and to live life more abundantly. And so today I want to uh, extend a special welcome to you wherever you are if you're joining us for the first time or you've been uh, with us uh, several times today we continue the sermon series fear not in this time of fear in this climate of fear we've been uh, living under the stress of the pandemic and it has made all the other fears grow even more in our lives and so it is important to remember uh, the invitation of the Holy Spirit, the invitation of God to us to fear not, to live life uh, with abundance, with a sense of trust, which is not easy to do in these days. And so uh, today we focus on uh, the gift of community, the gift of community, a caring community, and the power of a caring community to help us uh, get through times of fear. Uh, a true community of care is an antidote to fear. But the problem for us always is that we tend to separate ourselves and we tend to sort ourselves out by our uh, political views or social status or whatever it is we have uh, in terms of human divisions and we make our belonging to a community based on these divisions rather than the spirit of diversity uh, that God has created in our world. And so the key to a caring community is that it, if it reflects the diversity of God's creation. And this is not just about a pipe dream, you know, it's just, oh, all of us are gonna get along and everything is gonna be fine. It is about the core of who we are as human beings. If we honor the difference in others, if we honor um, that somebody might not be as abled as we are, or somebody might be differently abled, or somebody might be uh, might look different or talk differently, um, then we can see that we are safe to be who we are. If you belong to a community that defines uh, things in such narrow ways, you, uh, your soul is not going to show up. You're going to be afraid to be who you truly are as God's gift to the world. And so that's why diversity is important, not just for others, but for us to feel safe that wherever we are, with all of our faults and with all of our beauty, we can belong and we can be accepted and we can be affirmed and healed and forgiven when we make mistakes. And so uh, today we're looking at the vision of Isaiah uh, 11. Uh, this is a beautiful chapter about God's vision for diversity, for the healing of the nations. And I love uh, the imagery in it because it, you know, one of the things it talks about is the wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid. It's easy to love when, or to think that we are loving when uh, there's no challenge, uh, that the people that you're trying to love are people that are like you or uh, you're comfortable with, you know them, they're not a threat to you. But it's much harder to accomplish this vision, to live by that vision when you feel threatened, when you feel fearful. And so this, is, uh, this vision from Isaiah 11 is an incredible invitation to something deep within us, to embrace difference, to embrace people wherever they are, to, embrace, to allow ourselves to be broken, to be vulnerable, to be who we are called to be just as we are, to allow healing to happen through caring relationships. Uh, one of the concepts I learned um, through ministry is called Ubuntu. And this is from uh, Africa. It's a beautiful concept of, uh, it's a word that expresses something deep within us. Uh, and uh, Desmond Tutu talks about this concept a lot. Uh, he describes it this way. So basically it means I am because you are or we are together. Uh, so honoring, uh, in a way, the other person as ourselves. He says, uh, Desmond Tutu said, there's a core truth underneath that greeting, 
when they say Ubuntu to each other. You need other people in order to be human. You can't flourish without other human beings. You can live without deep relationships. People do it all the time. But you can't flourish. We need love to thrive, not just as recipients, but as participants, to be part of a beloved community. And I love that image, that we need that to flourish. Yes, we can live in surface relationships or in relationships where others agree with us and we have this little bubble around us. But in order to flourish, in order to thrive, we have to embrace the diversity and we have to allow others to embrace us as we are. And so today I pray that our worship will be opening our hearts to this mystery of how God created us so diverse and uh, opening our hearts to a new way of love. So let's uh, pray together today as we gather in worship and be considerate of uh, the places of deep suffering in our world, uh, the places who have struggled with uh, hurricanes repeatedly, uh, severe storms with wildfires, uh, the COVID-19 uh, victims and people who are surviving, uh, the economic impact of, of this year on so many people and the suffering around our world, uh, thinking especially also of places of conflict. Um, and so we come opening our hearts to God, to, to the mystery of love in the midst of fear. Take a deep breath and allow the Holy Spirit to open your heart, to embrace this moment And as I pray using the words of Psalm 23, may God touch your heart to know that depth of love, a love that is not related to circumstances, but to the core of who we are. Oh, my beloved, you are my shepherd, I shall not want. You bring me to green pastures for rest and lead me beside still waters, renewing my spirit. You restore my soul. You lead me in the path of goodness to follow love's way. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow and of death, I am not afraid. For you are ever with me. Your rod and your staff, they guide me. They give me strength and comfort. You prepare a table before me in the presence of all my fears. You bless me with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the heart of the beloved forever. So God, we pray that these words may become a reality for us each and every moment. Bless us in those places of deep fear. Bless the whole world to know the goodness of your love. We pray all of this in the way of Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to tell you today about a story from April of 2019. This was from um, StoryCorps on NPR. If you listen to those uh, little tidbits of stories, they kind of speak to the human spirit and our human experiences. And this was no different. This was a story of two people who had an incredible uh, bond forming uh, um, in their midst and they became friends out of this really fearful time. And this is about uh, Ellen Hughes and Keith Miller. Ellen Hughes has a son by the name of Walker. Uh, Walker was 33 years old, but he struggled with severe autism. And so there was one day when uh, he was really struggling and she needed to take him to the hospital, but she was fearful because her previous experiences in the emergency room were really terrifying for Walker. He's a large uh, man, and so he's intimidating when he has a seizure and people are fearful around him. And so, but she had no choice. She had to call uh, for uh, the emergency. 
Uh, so they, when he, they got to the emergency room, uh, she saw five men, security uh, guards, um, uh, security officers, who, were, who came and uh, were trying to subdue him. So she was very fearful. One of these was Keith Miller, who was a sergeant at the time. Uh, she said, but suddenly, as she was crying and fearful and thinking, you know, this is not going to end well for my son, she heard a game. She heard uh, Keith saying these words, Walker gets up, Walker sits down, Walker scoots back, Walker lies down, and then high fives all around. And to her surprise, the whole situation was diffused and Walker was high-fiving these men and all of a sudden she, uh, Keith uh, began to sing uh, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood song uh, and the whole situation turned around. Ellen couldn't believe this transformation and she of course got to know Keith and Keith uh, told her that he connected with that moment of suffering that she was experiencing because he himself had an autistic son and his son was 14 years old at the time and he imagined what would happen if his son was in the same place so he was ready to find a way to heal a very scary situation through love through playfulness and creativity uh, diffuse the whole situation and uh, he she he said, being a father of a child who, was, who has autism, I don't know what, what changes uh, are going to happen to occur in him. So he knows that this could be uh, like, end up like Walker. As a parent, uh, we are there to help uh, our children deal with their obstacles. And if we can't do it by ourselves, there's other people out there to help. And I want to be one of those other people. So they, uh, you can imagine the bond that formed between them. And I just love this, this incredible story because how many times a situation like this, exactly like that one, turned into ugliness and fear and then uh, death. Uh, you can think of the story of Daniel Prude in Rochester, uh, who was in a very similar situation uh, with mental illness, losing control, and uh, yet because of fear, it was not handled as uh, people could have. And so you can see the difference when we can open our hearts to love, to love not just those, as I said, that, that are like us, uh, but to love someone like Walker, to love someone in the midst of a crisis uh, and, and in the midst of a very fearful time, to love in that way is so incredibly healing. And it is the way out of so many of the, of the problems we are facing today. Uh, we can try all kinds of other methods, but unless we learn how to love our way through these crises, we will not find a way forward that will help us flourish. We may find a way forward, but it's we would be surviving instead of thriving. And so we look today at, this, at the vision of Isaiah, the vision of the prophet for his own community to remind them at a time of crisis, they had problems inside, they had threats on the outside, um, and there was corruption. And he spoke a word of hope to them, reminding them that it is possible to have leaders who embody the vision of God. Uh, the prophet spoke of a vision of this shoot of Jesse. And a lot of times we read that around Christmas time thinking of Jesus, but he was also speaking of other people. So let's listen to some of the words from Isaiah 11. A shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of uh, the fear of the Lord. And then this is the sign that this is the leader, the kind of leader that God would want. He says, the wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. A little child sh shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nurse, the nursing child shall play over the hole 
of the asp. And the weaned child shall put its hand on the adder's den. They, shall, they will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And on that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nation shall inquire of him and his dwelling shall be glorious. So to think about this uh, incredible vision for people who were scared, they were living in a time of great fear, the threats around them from other nations uh, were credible and imminent, and they had corrupt leaders. Now some may think, oh, this is just a pipe dream, you know, this is, uh, of course, religious talk. Uh, but the prophets in the old uh, times, in the old days, they were not like what we think today. They were not religious leaders in uh, separate institutions. They were court prophets. Isaiah was certainly a court prophet in the sixth uh, century bef before the common era. He was uh, there with the leadership, with the political leadership. See, because the politics and the religious, uh, the political and religious leaders were one and the same. So prophets had an important role. They watched the kings, they watched the rulers, and they called them back to the vision of God, to the vision of justice. And so Isaiah was one who was very familiar with the realities of corruption, of uh, power-hungry leaders, of leaders who didn't care about the poor and the hungry and the, and the people who were struggling. So Isaiah gives this incredible vision not because he was naive, it's because he was fully aware of God's presence in the world. He saw at a deeper level. He saw at a deeper level than what humans normally look at, at the surface of fear and of uh, relationships where we sort ourselves out by our groupings. He saw the depth of the human experience. He saw that there is goodness, that there are people that at, in our core, we are like Ellen Hughes and Keith Miller. We connect with each other. We have that in us. That's who we are. That's how God created us. We get distracted. We lose our way. We go into the path of fear, but deep within us, goodness really connects. And so the call of the prophet was not a call in vain, was a vision to help people remember what is possible. Remember how God has created us, what God has prepared for us. And this vision of the peaceable kingdom, of people coming together, of wild animals that usually are enemies, is the model for us. And so today, I invite you to consider that for community, for caring communities. See how you belong to uh, groupings of people and how you allow diversity to be part of those groupings. How we live and how we model those connections, not just for others, but for ourselves, to be allowed the freedom to be true to our nature, to our deeper nature of goodness. Uh, one of the uh, quotes I want to share with you is that from Eric Law in his book, Fear Not. He talks about our different approaches. You know, and as human beings, when we're in a crisis, we try all kinds of methods to deal with fear. We try technology, we try uh, power, we try war, we try other things. But really, unless we create communities of grace, communities of care, those other things become hindrances to, to our thriving. So he says, what I've learned is that using ex external approaches, such as rules, technologies, and rituals, now those are important, but they can't substitute for the, the loving communities. To deal with our fears, so we're using them to deal with our fear, is often if ineffective, as long as we were buying substitutes for facing our fears such as using our tax money to wage wars, hire, hiring people in new uniforms to check the passengers and their bags at the airports, and devising color-coded alert systems that encourage us to be suspicious of our neighbors, we will continue to feel fear's negative effects in alienating us from ourselves, from others, from our communities. 
we have to find other ways to address our fears that will bring people together in a trusting community so that we can face our fears faithfully in those places of care. So, so we work together. Uh, that's the way out of our fears. All the technology, all the, the things that we can put together, unless we build communities of care, they don't work. They don't help us thrive. They actually hinder our growth. And so law uses the uh, TerraCode uh, alert system you know, that was developed after 9-11, um, where he says, you know, there's the times of, of peace or low risk. And then, you know, it goes up and up in terms of alert. But he says we could, we could use those to see, to alert ourselves to a developing community instead of separating ourselves by our fears. So he says we, we need to invest. In relationships getting to know our neighbors in times of peace so uh, when a crisis comes we have the systems of connection in place those caring communities can carry us through these difficult times our educational uh, systems uh, institutions or uh, community organizations uh, like churches or uh, service clubs or whatever it is that bring us together to get to know our neighbors, to get to know our neighbors in their own diversity, in their own ways, to love them, to accept them, to respect them. That's the way forward. That's the way to healing. And that's the vision of Christ for our world. Um, he brought people together from all walks of life, those who were rejected especially, and showed that all were worthy of God's love. And so here we are today, invited to do the same, to follow in those footsteps, to imagine this vision of the peaceable kingdom that Isaiah uh, imagined and saw in, in the eyes of his uh, faith through, through that incredible connection he had with God to inspire us today, to face the challenges we are facing, to face the fear so we're not living in that deep place of fear or hate, but we're living from an abiding uh, place of love. It doesn't mean that life is gonna be easy, it doesn't mean that we don't have challenges, but what it means is that we have the tools, we have the tools to not allow these challenges to annihilate us, to destroy our sense of who we are, to lead us to hate, to lead us to violence. And so today, I want to end with an affirmation, a prayer, if you will. And uh, hopefully this will be uh, to bridge the gap between the world uh, we are living in, in terms of the fear, to the world God calling us into to that sense of connection. And I wanna use the image of the resurrection of Jesus as our guide, because in it, you can see the gaps uh, and the fears that were conquered, that were transformed. And so I invite you to center yourself, take a deep breath, and listen to these affirmations for you how God will speak to you about your role in nurturing, caring communities. There was a time when people thought that the dead stayed lifeless, when the end of the road was the end of the road. But Jesus is risen from the dead, and so we now know that there is nothing to fear in life. Nothing is lost and gone that cannot rise into something new. Even the garbage heap can yield grains of gold. There was a time when a closed door stayed shut, when we locked ourselves away from the fear and loss we could not face. But Jesus is risen from the dead. He came through locked doors to greet his, faith, his fearful followers. So now we can walk free of fear to face new challenges and opportunities, even into the places where we've only dreamed of going. There was a time when we felt alone and separate from God, from others, 
When we called out in our emptiness without being sure anyone heard us. But Jesus is risen from the dead. He came to Galilee to break bread and eat it with his dear friends. So now we know his presence with, it, with us amidst human frailty, especially during this pandemic, the darkest night of our time. Jesus showed us how to break down the walls of hostility that divide us. And so we are invited to live this day as those who are reconciled to one another and who know Jesus' radical way of love, of compassion, and of grace. Amen. So friends, as I send you uh, this day with this message of the importance of love and relationships and connections, especially with those uh, in the larger community, with those who are different from us. I send you with the words of Bishop Michael Curry about love. He said, stop and imagine for a minute. Think and imagine. Think and imagine a world where love is the way. Imagine our homes and families when love is the way. Imagine our neighborhoods and communities where love is the way. Imagine governments and nations where love is the way. Imagine business and commerce when love is the way. Imagine this tired old world when love is the way. When love is the way, unselfish, sacrificial, redemptive, when love is the way, there is no child that will go to bed hungry in this world ever again. When love is the way, we will let justice roll down like a mighty stream and righteousness like an ever-flowing brook. When love is the way, poverty would become history. When love is the way, the earth will be a sanctuary. When love is the way, we will lay our swords and shields down by the riverside to study war no more. When love is the way, there is plenty of room for all God's children. When love is the way, we actually treat each other well, like we're family. May we live by this vision of love, this day and forevermore. And so as you go, my friends, go with the peace of Christ, with the knowledge that you are loved and you are to love in the same way. Amen.